Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Uh, today's episode is sponsored by Dopamine. Do you feel down or maybe blue? Then this drug is for you. Don't waste your time with the traditional antidepressants because this isn't one. This is the happy pill for everyone, every day. Think of your happiest moments in your life. How often do they occur? Every few weeks, months, maybe years? Well, take those times and make them every day. Targeting your brain's hedonic and eudaimonic networks, our pill makes every day a happy day. What makes you truly happy? Are you generally a happy person? Happiness is one of the oldest emotions to be studied, but was long ignored by its, the scientific community. Maybe it was because of its frivolousness, or maybe it was because it was difficult to find happiness in animal models. Recently, happiness research has entered a renaissance as researchers turn to functional imaging and other new techniques to look inside the brain while we experience pleasantness, pleasure, and everything this side of happy. I speak with Dita Karvadabhasha about happiness in the brain. as I hope I'm saying that close <laughs> enough. Uh, we're talking about happiness in the brain uh, today. Uh, and so uh, what got you interested in being happy, or at least the brain and being happy? Um, I think when I was wondering about what projects I would, um, what project I was interested in or what I should look further into, I kind of thought, um, I, I knew I was interested in feelings and what made people kind of feel things. And I knew that um, just kind of, just the notion of like the pursuit of happiness is what we all kind of strive to do. And um, I remember my mom, we were talking about like, I was talking about what I wanted my major to be. She's like, you know, just do what makes you happy. And like in context of this class, I was like, I don't know, like I, first of all, like even what is happiness in one sense, but also I just wanted to kind of understand it in a, in a more scientific way where it was, um, where it could be kind of objective and not as this crazy relative term that meant different things to other people. So I just think, I think just in the context of like a college student trying to figure out, even though I'm only a first year, just kind of trying to figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life and what would make me happy, I think kind of actually discovering what happiness is in the context of my brain was just something that made sense to me. Yeah. Do you think having the scientific knowledge of happiness has taken away some of its I, shine or luster? I think it's very, just kind of, first of all, foundations of psychology and kind of understanding how it basically is like common, not common sense, but things that like are very true but kind of explained scientifically um, it kind of is in the same thing where it doesn't really take away from the sense of happiness or my understanding of it but kind of is just like oh it, in a way it's like oh so like everything that I think and feel is like all related back to chemicals in my brain like wow but also I think it's just like it's kind of cool to understand what you're feeling and why not necessarily why but how in a way so I think in some ways if I look at it it's kind of like kind of sucks that it all comes down to like biology and chemicals in my brain and different uh, neural pathways and stuff like that, but I think in another sense, it's just another way of understanding what exactly it is I'm feeling and what I, why I'm feeling it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the comic that I have for our emotions when we're studying them in a couple of weeks is uh, dopamine and serotonin, truly the only things you actually like. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but how about it? So looking at some of the research that you've come across, uh, is there anything that's been really interesting? I think one of the biggest problems in my research was that every article I read was like, this is what happiness is, but also we need to we need to research more. And then the ver at the end of every article is like, this is what we found, but it's still emerging. And this is what we've kind of come to um, understand about it. But like the neuro the exact neuroscience of happiness is still expanding. So it was kind of interesting to me that every single article kind of came back like no matter what they said about happiness or whatever but they all came sort of came back to the conclusion like this this article this um scientific field is not yet developed so that was kind of i guess the most interesting part where they all kind of all these like scientists trying to figure out what happy happiness is we are all kind of like well like we don't even know yet um but i think also another thing that was very interesting when i was doing my research is that I kind of went into it expecting like trying to figure out what makes people happy and then all of most of the articles that I looked at or most of the research behind it kind of looked into what goes in on what goes in our minds while when we're happy or during feelings of happiness so it was just kind of interesting to kind of have my view of happiness switched and kind of understand that it is a very relative term but even though it is very relative it still can be studied in this like 
scientific context. Mm -hmm. Have you yeah. seen any problems of defining happiness? Yeah. So a lot of um, a lot of what the happiness is like happiness is this big whole umbrella term of whatever emotions people feel, but in general, they all kind of went back to Aristotle and his two views of happiness. So just basically pleasure as a synonym for happiness was what a lot of the articles kind of um, went back to. And there, even in that, in, in a sense of pleasure, there are still two different definitions. So there's just like not momentary pleasure, but there's just pleasure. And it's like, I eat a cookie, I'm happy. But there's also um, a, a life of pleasure, which is just this long-term sense of happiness that scientists have to kind of differentiate between whether or not they're looking at pleasure, which is the hedonic um, side, or the, I can't pronounce this word correctly, eudaimonic side, which is just a life well lived. So okay. there, even in the sense of happiness and the sense of pleasure, there are still two very different definitions that they mostly only focus on the hedonic because the eudonic, sorry, I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, it's in the video though. Um, the eudonic one is such a relative long-term thing that they can't really place 100%. Um, so yeah, so even there is just two very different, there's one understood de definition that it is related to pleasure, but even within that, there's two separate um, kind of approaches to it. Okay, and my, my place in my own vocab on it, might the like long-term or the eudaimonic uh, yeah. <laughs> be something more like satisfaction? Yeah, so it's kind of just like a happy person m rather than a happy moment. Okay. So um, it's kind of more just looking at the whole, like, like we're all striving for a life well lived, but in the moment, where it's like it's very different so okay. yeah one is like very holistic and more like less not really something you can study right at that moment but it's more of like a like looking back when you're 70 years old be like I had a life full of pleasure yeah yeah okay uh, and so sticking in there is, is there anything uh, that seems confusing that um, you might uh, find a way to clear up for the public it seems like the whole field is a little bit confused yeah it is, it is basically everyone's just trying to figure out what um, what exactly is going in our minds through pleasure, but I think a lot of what the public is, co or what I was first concerned about was what makes people happy. Um, and I think that's what the field is just trying to uncover too, because there is a lot of, um, what I found in my research was that there was a lot of study that went on with like, does money make people happy? Is money the cause of happiness and stuff like that? Um, so I think just in terms of that, another really interesting thing that I learned is that there was a study that compared um, people that the happiness of people that just won the lottery and the happiness of people that um, recently uh, were recovering from a car crash and they found basically no differences in happiness or recorded levels of happiness and they also studied um, the I think the 50 most the richest Americans and then compared their levels of reported happiness to average Americans and again there was no difference and so there is that kind of thing where because you have more money, you're not happier. But then there's another flip side to it where people that are financially stable are happier in their lives. So there's just this kind of difference. The whole thing, like, does money buy you happiness and stuff like that? The direct answer is sometimes because it is, because because you're rich, being rich doesn't make you happy, but having money does make you happier. So there's like this very confusing kind of situation where having, where money leads you to kind of have a finance, be financially stable, have have home, have a shelter, and like have um, food and all that, which does make a person happy, but it doesn't make them happier than the average person that already has those things. Um, yeah, I, that was a huge thing in the news last year. Uh, there was a, this, I don't know how to explain the company, but it was a like, Northwest uh, company that does like credit card transactions, yeah. but it, it was like the, every time you pay, uh, use your credit card, uh, there's like a bill uh, mm -hmm. towards the store for like having that ability oh. to charge credit cards. And they were like trying to reduce that fee and do different things. But anyways, the uh, co-CEO of that decided to pay everyone in the company $70,000 because oh, wow. research had shown that 70000 was like kind of the tipping point where it was enough money that uh, you were happy, but anything beyond that, you yeah. get like measurable gains in, in happiness. Interesting. Uh, and so there was this huge uproar in the <laughs> business community like why are they paying you know people at the bottom so yeah the people at the top interesting uh, and so it was an interesting social experiment I think they're still in business yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to put read that for the blog uh, later uh, let's see how about um, the public response to your video the uh, uh, Haverford uh, yeah. Twitter tweeted it out <laughs> they've tweeted to uh, Pharrell he hasn't uh, responded <laughs> yet but 
Uh, have you heard from other people that uh, have viewed um, the video? I think, yeah, I, like, I showed my, my family and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and I showed a couple of my friends, and I think, um, at least with my video, I was, I did a video because I knew that I kind of, I liked using iMovie, which was kind of difficult to deal with in yeah. itself, um, but I knew that I wanted to do something more engaging and more kind of, I guess, fun, where it was, um, I really liked, like, when I'm, like, scrolling through Facebook, I like looking at, like, the BuzzFeed, like, 30 second videos and stuff like that and I tried to mirror it that way but I think for the most part um everyone was just kind of for the people where like I sat and watched as they watched it probably wasn't the best way to kind of generate a response but I think um I don't know I feel like it, it was well well received just because I there were a couple of like I wouldn't say controversial things but I guess where um where I talked about the money um thing was kind of the only thing I really was worried about where people would be like I don't know if I believe you on that um, but I think for the most part it was kind of pretty straightforward and it generated a I got like last time I checked I had like 50 ish views so or 27 I remember I checked it was like 14 I checked the next day it was like 27 and I think now it's like 54 um, but as long as YouTube doesn't take it down for copyright uh -huh. I think I'll be I'll be good I think it would still be cool because then we'll cause an uproar because yeah. them taking it down. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, YouTube. So here comes. Yeah, 54 views, 30, yeah. 30 likes. Yeah. Uh, I really wish I could see who liked them, but I can't. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, uh, well, I'm one of them. So. <laughs> well, now I know. <laughs> yeah. So two, uh, two more people, uh, strangers out there. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we're talking. So if you search on YouTube, the cognitive uh, neuroscience of happiness, uh, you'll see the great video. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do you think going forward, uh, there's any new or developing areas of research that would be particularly interesting? Yeah, I think just the whole field in general is kind of still a very um, is still developing because I know in the field of emotions, a lot of what people kind of studied for were fear um, and stuff like that, just rooted in the amygdala and kind of um, and stuff. But I think. I don't know, I feel like the whole field in general is just developing and moving forward in the sense where they're kind of, they're having, they have to figure out, um, in general, they also have to figure out what makes a, a life well lived, the other side of the, the pleasure kind of two ways that they haven't really looked into. But I think, yeah, I think in general, it's, it's still a very developing field. Not, we do know that there are hedonic hotspots in our brain, which are just the places where that are, that light up in, in scans when people have feelings of happiness but in general there's not like a solidified this is the neuroscience of happiness this is where happiness is generated from this is the one thing it's generated from but yeah I think just in general it is a very young and new field that people are just have started to um dive into so I think yeah I think in the in the next coming years I'm sure if someone redoes this video um for whatever project they have it'll be pretty different yeah um, I mean, what, do you think it's something about the human condition that I'm live Googling, which is not <laughs> always the best, uh, but something about the human condition that fear in the brain uh, is uh, here looking at Google over 1,270,000 results. And then if I change that to uh, happiness in the brain, I get 218,000 uh, results. Yeah. So o over a million less uh, views. I think, yeah, I think it probably has just have, I don't know, maybe it has to do with how relative the term of happiness is because it is very two very different things make make people happy I think but also in terms of just fear versus happiness I think just in my perception of it fear is more solidified like we know that first of all fear is an evolutionary trait where we have to be afraid to kind of um do these Avoid things problems, yeah, yeah exactly but I think happiness is kind of in some ways it another controversial thing that I learned is that um happiness is in fact evolutionary and evolutionary in the sense where mice also kind of generated the fa the same facial structures as babies when they tasted things that were sweet as when they tasted things that were bitter and so i think just in terms of how important it is to people i think being happy obviously is important to a lot of people but in the scientific community it isn't as important as feelings of fear because it doesn't have those like so those like solidified evolutionary advantages yeah exactly yeah. um so i think maybe part of that just just kind of how people perceive happiness and perceive fear um kind of is related to that but i also just think that um fear we know that it's like the amygdala and we know that there's like we're afraid of like snakes inherently and all that stuff but also like what are we inherently happy because and stuff like stuff like that so i think just in terms of the scientific community as well it's not it's kind of both ways where the public um, 
isn't as responsive to it because it's not as respected in the scientific community. But again, that's just my um, my take on it. Yeah, and my last question going about the research, have you come across anything about the like neurochemical enhancements of happiness? I, I guess I'm thinking of the other side, so people in, with depression using happy pills. Yeah, um, um, I think... No, I haven't. Re- my research has kind of been geared more toward like what happens in our brain as when, you're feeling. yeah, as you're feeling happy. But I think that would be that was another thing I was very worried about that I was leaving out um, in my research, just because I kind of felt like if I talk about happiness, I have to talk about unhappiness well, yeah. and the flip side of it. But I think in terms of um, in terms of my research, I kind of took it from the articles I was reading. If they didn't mention the the flip side to it, I kind of took it as a whole other like not lack of happiness but kind of as a whole other like sadness as its own thing um so i think yeah i think if i kind of take it as un i took it more as sadness separate from happiness but if i take it as unhappiness as connected to a lack of happiness or something like that i think it would take my research in a different way um but yeah i think it just depends on where i want to focus it on and i think as i write the paper and as i look more into it um maybe i'll like decide which which um, road I want to travel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So the, uh, as we're wrapping up here, uh, I know you said that you had something to promote. <laughs> um, okay, so April 8th um, at 7.30 or 8.30, we're not 100% sure, at James House, um, Collections, the photo exhibit will um, premiere. And basically it's just, we gave out about 30 disposable cameras to 30 different groups and kids on campus to kind of broadcast and showcase their Haverford experience. Um, so if you're interested, you'll probably, since the school is so small, you'll be in one of the photos, you can see your friends' photos. Um, but yeah, if you're just interested in how other people's, um, and what other people's Haverford experiences are like, and if you want to broaden your understanding of what the Haverford experience is, I suggest you come. All right, and uh, any uh, other like fad or interesting product or something you've come across recently that uh, you're just dying to tell other people about? <laughs> Not particularly, but there is these kind of, I was just looking at my phone, there's like the, um, this like card holder at the bookstore where you, I don't even know what this is for, but I kind of am just used to doing it all the time and it's very addicting and anyone, and even like the baby that I babysit, every time I come and babysit her, she like has to do it and just in general, it's very, very addicting and I suggest that everyone goes to buy one. It's the Red right. Haverford one. Haverford bookstore. Yeah. Magnetic card Heart. holder. I don't even know what it's called, but All it's right. very, it's very addicting. Well, at least a shout out to the bookstore. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for coming and talking thank about you. happiness. I feel like I'm more happy. <laughs> <laughs>Thanks again to Dita for coming in. Uh, with the last two segments of uh, the episode, uh, we'll go to Jake's Jams. Jake's Jams are where I talk about something that I've been jamming lately, something that I've been digging and uh, really enjoying. Uh, I've been using Audacity uh, to uh, edit these podcasts together, and I've been really uh, impressed with how easy it is to uh, be able to edit a number of different tracks with the music, uh, the commercial, and the actual uh, recording together. Uh, it's just been really intuitive and easy to use, uh, so it's something that I'd recommend. Audacity, a free uh, audio editing app, but it's also something I've uh, used in my own research. Uh, and then the last segment, uh, the mailbag or the Twitter tweets. Uh, no tweets have been coming in since I've uh, started recording these podcasts, but uh, you can always tweet me at Engage Brain, uh, and in this segment I'd answer those questions uh, for uh, anything that you have in mind. I'm happy to uh, speak with anyone. Uh, so, as we go forward, uh, tweet me at Engage Brain uh, to ans- ask your question, or if you have a really long one, you can email me at my last name at gmail.com. Thanks, and I'll catch you next time.